This book has been a long time in coming. Uh, its title, The Struggle Continues, uh, reflects both the, 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 the national struggles within Zimbabwe, but also uh, the personal struggles, my own uh, lifetime struggles, which we, we all face. I describe it as an autobiographical political history of Zimbabwe. And although the subtitle, 50 Years of Ty Tyranny, would appear to suggest that it only deals with the last 50 years, it, it does in fact go back some 60 years uh, to the 1950s, to the times of the uh, federation of the then Rhodesias and Nyasaland. Uh, I go back 60 years, mainly, of course, because that was when I was born in, in the 1950s, but also because my own belief is that the Federation, certainly under the rule of then Prime Minister Garfield Todd, offered the country a way forward. Uh, the country at that time was charting a very different path uh, to that being charted by the apartheid nationalist government in South Africa. Uh, but sadly, soon after I was born, in February 1958, Garfield Todd um, was dismissed by his own cabinet. And although he was replaced by a relatively moderate man, uh, the country started its uh, track downwards. And the 50 years of tyranny relates to the unilateral declaration of independence on the 11th of November 1965 uh, by Ian Smith and the Rhodesian Front Party. And the, the 50th anniversary of that unilateral declaration was, of course, celebrated last November at the time when the book uh, was taken to the publishers. And that's why we put in 50 years of tyranny. I've been challenged, and I've been delighted to have been challenged by by both ends of the political spectrum uh, regarding that subtitle. Uh, ZANU-PF uh, have objected to, to me describing the last 36 years of their rule as a tyranny. And uh, former members of the Rhodesian Front and supporters of Ian Smith's government objected to me calling his period of rule between 1965 and 1980 as a tyranny. But my intent in the book is, is to show that, in fact, both uh, governments are characterized by tyranny. Both governments have employed arbitrary, oppressive rule uh, to secure power and, and to maintain power. One of the dominant themes in the book uh, is to demonstrate how the forces of extremism have subverted the potential of, of Zimbabwe. Uh, my belief is that although, of course, in the 1950s, uh, under federation and even under a relatively uh, moderate ruler like Garfield Todd, the black uh, majority of Zimbabwe suffered great indignities under racial discrimination, at least under his regime, a new path was being charted uh, which ultimately, had he been allowed to pursue that path, I believe would have ushered in far more democratic and moderate order. But that was subverted. Uh, unfortunately, there were, of course, major other political events at play, in particular the collapse of Belgian ru rule in the Congo, uh, which frightened a lot of, of white Rhodesians and pushed them to, to the right. And, of course, the rhetoric of nationalist movements contributed to that as well. Tragically, uh, that polarization of our society, which took place in the 1960s, resulted in a war, a dreadful war, Zimbabwe's own Vietnam, a fought with all the tenacity uh, that Vietnam was uh, fought on. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I... I um, paid my respects at the Vietnam uh, Memorial here. And it, it is always, I, I make a point of going to it, just as I went to 
uh, the 9-11 memorial to see the, the names. I think it's the most poignant, your two most poignant uh, memorials because they, they are a stark reminder of the cost of um, certainly the Vietnam War and the, the act of terrorism on, at 9-11. So often war is projected in the minds of, of, of people as something glorious. Uh, but certainly my own experience of war is something far different. And unfortunately, Zimbabwe has been affected by the war which was waged in our country as a result of this polarization, as a result of this extremism, as a result of people who are not prepared to negotiate and moderate a political solution. Both sides, nationalist forces and the Rhodesian front, front forces, felt that... Uh, it was only through a demonstration of physical, raw military power that this political uh, dilemma could be resolved. With deleterious consequences for the country, uh, it poisoned our nation, and that poison still subsists to this day. And any analysis of Zimbabwe uh, is, um, will... will uh, any analysis of, of Zimbabwe without taking into account the effects of, of that war will not be complete. Uh, if one seeks to understand why it is that Robert Mugabe and ZANU-PF have gone to such lengths and have enjoyed the enthusiastic support of so many war veterans in, for example, uh, pursuing the land reform program that they've embarked on in the last 15 years, one can see its roots in that war. Uh, Paul Hardcastle, uh, an English songwriter, a few years ago had a single called 19, a hit single, which referred to the average age of war veterans in Vietnam. And one of the, the lines in that song is that 800,000 Americans are still to this day fighting the Vietnam War. Well, that applies to Zimbabwe as well. The difference between Zimbabwe and America and Vietnam, of course, is that all the protagonists in our war are still in the country. And we have never resolved uh, that conflict which ended 36 years ago. And so when Robert Mugabe in 2000 made a call to arms and uh, said that uh, whites were seeking to, to regain power and that uh, there needed to be this determined thrust to take over farmland. He found very willing and ready uh, operatives in the form of war veterans who didn't need much reminding about what they had been through. And of course, when they came onto farms, they met the very people, many of them, the, the same people, who fought against them in the war then 20 years previously. And tragically, this dreadful legacy affects Zimbabwe to this day. Uh, let me stress that uh, one cannot excuse uh, Robert Mugabe based on that war for all that he has done. Much of it is inexcusable. But it does help us to understand some of the motivations behind him and how he has managed to bring much of a nation along with him in the pursuit of policies that have almost utterly destroyed Zimbabwe's economy uh, and certainly gravely undermined its potential. Um, the conclusion of my book is not, funnily enough, pessimistic. I'm not... A a pessimist by nature, I'm an Afro-optimist. Not just uh, optimistic about Zimbabwe, but about Africa in general, in particular southern, southern Africa. And I don't believe that it's naive optimism. Certainly if one looks at southern Africa and analyzes where it is today, and if one compares that situation to where southern Africa was 20, 30 years ago, one can see that there has been progress. Most southern African countries are changing their leaders peacefully and democratically. Most southern African nations have embraced democracy. 
In fact, Zimbabwe remains an exception. And that exception doesn't apply to its people. Uh, the Zimbabwean electorate, Zimbabwe people, have consistently, over the last certainly uh, 16 years, sought to change their leadership peacefully through the ballot. That has been denied them. Does that mean that Zimbabwe is a write-off, that it will become a failed state? I don't believe it's so. I think we were very close to becoming a failed state in 2008, and Marion spoke about that, that report that Cato did about uh, the collapse of the Zimbabwe, the, the collapse of the Zimbabwean economy then. But we're not in that position any longer, although the economy is now in decline again. Zimbabwe is not a Liberia or a Somalia. It is a country with <clears throat> enormous potential. In fact, it's got virtually every ingredient necessary to become a successful modern nation state, save for one critical in ingredient, and that is democracy. Uh, the struggle uh, for democracy continues. Uh, and I believe that through the perseverance of very brave colleagues of mine who are documented in this book, ultimately, we will achieve that goal. But we cannot do it alone. We need the support of the international community to encourage Mugabe and ZANU-PF to allow these democratic processes to take place. And we need the international community as well to be focused on our neighbors to encourage them to do the right thing. My hope for this book, in, in conclusion, is that it will provoke debate about the history so that we have a better understanding of our past, to understand that this single-dimensional view of Mugabe and ZANU-PF does not do our, our history justice. And I hope that um, it's very strong message, the need for us to resolve our problems using non-violent democratic means uh, will uh, be carried through and respected.